Um, okay, that should be working now. Okay, well, thank you so much everyone for coming tonight. Um, welcome to the first of our series of four virtual lectures about gardening with nature. Um, I'm your host, Morgan Thapa. I work with Be More Beautiful, and we are so happy to be collaborating with the Master Gardeners of Baltimore City to bring you these informative sessions. Um, so a few quick housekeeping things. Uh, while our speaker is presenting, please keep yourself on mute. Um, you can type questions into the chat or raise your hand, and I will interrupt Debbie and <laughs> let her know those questions. Um, We'll also end with a question and answer session. So you're welcome to save them up till then. Um, and like I said, yeah, this meeting's being recorded. Um, so yeah, tonight we'll be learning about Baywise gardening uh, with Debbie Schwartz. Um, Debbie grew up in New England where she spent a lot of her time outside in the natural world. She has been a Baltimore City Master Gardener for 20 years is chair of the Baywise Committee and is certified to teach environmentally sustainable practices. Her garden is a demonstration garden for Baywise and for Audubon. Um, if she's going to plant something, it has to feed someone, either wildlife or people. I love that philosophy. Oh. Um, so thank you so much, Debbie, for being with us and feel free to take it away. Um, let me know if you can share your screen. You should have that permission on here. Okay. Um, Thanks, thanks, Morgan. Hi, yeah, I'm Debbie, and um, I'm really happy that Morgan asked me to speak tonight. Um, I much prefer teaching in person, um, and usually this lecture is very, it's not a lecture at all, it's very interactive, it's more of a conversation. So feel free to um, ask any questions at any time. And let's see, how do we begin? Are you going to put up the, whoops, that's not it. Morgan, are you going to put up the PowerPoint? Oh, do you, you want me to, to do it? I didn't know if, because you said oh, you wanted sorry. to. Oh, sorry, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. I can pull it up. Okay. Okay. Um... That, that, that's beyond my technical ability. I spend all my time outside, not, not on the computer, so I can't do that. Oh my gosh, no, I, I love that and appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here we go. Okay, so, um, so Baywise is part of University of Maryland Extension. That's what Master Gardeners are through. And it's a better way to garden. And everything I'm gonna tell you guys, I feel like um, it's all about nature and it's all about what our bodies and brains are designed to do. So all of us have a good foundation to put this already. Most of the things I'm gonna say um, just are gonna make total sense and you're just gonna have a lot of aha moments. It's just that we've gotten so far away from all this stuff, we need to be reminded. Okay, so the next slide. Morgan. Ah, okay. So the water is at the very, very lowest point. Everything we do affects water. It doesn't matter if you're right next to a stream or you're up on a mountain miles away from a river, everything eventually makes its way into the water. And if we don't have clean water, we can't live. And if we have water like we have now, we don't have as healthy or enjoyable a lifestyle as, as we could. So that's why we are concentrating on the water part because every single thing we do affects the water. Okay, so next slide. Also, wanted to uh, let you know, Debbie, there's a little bit of a lag, and this happened one time with another presentation, so I am pressing okay. it, but it might just take a second. Okay. Um, so, anyway, everything we do, as I said, ends up in the bay or in the water. We can keep going. I'm going to kind of go through the scientific things at the beginning here, real the technical things really quickly, because there are things you can see in the book just to give you context. And then we're gonna get into all the things for problem solving and different solutions for things. So we live in a watershed and this just gives you um, a map and shows the watershed that goes all the way up to New York, which is really interesting. So 
not only the farmers in Pennsylvania, but everything that's happening up in New York is coming down, not the city, thank goodness, but in Western New York and, and Northwest New York is all coming down and being filtered into the Chesapeake Bay. So in, in Baltimore, the, we have a lot of tributaries going into the bay and this is just showing you how intricate it is and how many water tributaries we have. And we have a lot of species of fish and, um, and birds and plant species. And there's a lot of things that live near the bay and depend on the bay and also contribute to the health of the water. So it's a really important, delicate ecosystem. And there we are, this is the bay. So everything that goes in a storm drain, right, goes into the bay. So people say, well, I don't live near the water, but everyone lives near a storm drain. And this is what happens when people um, aren't connected with that and don't understand the consequences of um, dumping and littering. That's sad. Okay, this I love. Okay, there's a, you can either be a green filter or a gray funnel. A green filter is what our um, environment is designed to do. It's the trees and it's the earth and it's all the roots and we're gonna get into this more in the rest of the presentation. And that is called a green filter. What we have in Baltimore is a gray funnel. We have paved over everything. We have lots of cars. We have lots of pollution going into our storm drains. And we've removed all the things that we need in order to have a healthy ecosystem and have clean water. The Chesapeake Bay used was established on an oak forest and we no longer have, sorry, another thought, another thought, Morgan. Um, it was established around an oak forest, which it no longer has. So we'll get into that more later, but remember that the oak forest, because that's a really important thing that is going to come into play. So depressing, depressing. If anyone wants like more information on this or wants to study this more, I'll be happy to send you these slides, but it's just showing you um, how much, um, how many poor zones and dead zones there are in the Bay now. And how many fish kills and all the algae. So, and this is a breakdown of what is exa exactly what is polluting the Bay. And agriculture is a really, really big part of it. And a lot of it, it's, I mean, we're doing plenty in Maryland, trust me, but a lot of the agriculture is coming from Pennsylvania and um, they don't have the strong laws because it's not affecting them, it's affecting us. So we've got to all get together and work in concert um, to, for a good solution. Oh, and keep on going, but sewage in, the sewage industry also, because believe it or not, our infrastructure is so ancient, we still have some wooden pipes in Baltimore. So there's a lot of problems with sewage also. Okay, so this is everything we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about controlling stormwater runoff, encouraging wildlife, protecting the waterfront, how to mow properly and water efficiently, uh, manage yard pests with IPM, which is which is integrated pest management, which is basically letting the good bugs eat the bad bugs and not intervening very much. Um, mulching appropriately and recycling yard waste, fertilizing wisely and planting wisely. So we have a little work to do in this hour, so we'll get going right away. Um, so in order to protect the water, um, Right, right by a storm drain is we all have, or most of us have turf, have grass that came into uh, popularity um, in the 18th century. And it was a sign of wealth and uh, it was a status symbol. And everyone kind of hopped onto that and no one's ever sort of evolved from that. So we're trying to teach people how to evolve from that because that's no longer relevant. And so, Grasses in particular, native grasses, have really, really thick, deep roots and they're, very, and they're big masses. So they're a great thing to plant near storm drains because they slow down the water. They also filter the water. Okay, this says everything. I love this so much. A picture says a, a million words, right? 
This is how people dressed in the 18th century. And this is how they gardened in the 18th century. And it doesn't, the clothing looks different now, but the gardens don't. So this is just sort of a great sort of aha wake up moment that um, it, we used to feel that nature was something that needed to be conquered and controlled. Now we understand that nature is something that is wonderful and perfect and it doesn't need to be managed. We need to be a steward of nature. That pretty much means help it just do what it needs to do, protect it. So we were talking about roots. So there are roots and there are roots and the native plants have much deeper roots. Sod, think about sod, it's about three inches high. That means the roots are three inches deep. Most plants have a root the depth of their height. So deep roots filter the pollutants and support life. And having the grasses and all the different um, native plants really, really helps with the water and helps slow down erosion. So people are always thinking just what's on top, but you have to start thinking about what's going on under the soil also. So you wanna keep your storm drains clear of debris. Um, you wanna do everything you can to control the uh, runoff. Rain bar barrels are great. Downspots, uh, downspots should be uh, pointed into your lawn and then We'll talk later about you know, rain gardens and things you can put in your lawn to stop and absorb the water um, rather than have the water um, be pushed out directly into the road, which is just um, adds more and more to pollution and to erosion. Um, so the wide borders we were talking about and also picking up pet waste is really important. So this bottom picture shows um, you don't have to go totally crazy, you know, putting in on a hill, putting in some deep, deep, I mean, I hope you go crazy, but if you put some deep rooted things in on a hill, that's great. That does a lot. And the less grass, the better. Um, pervious surfaces are also great to reduce erosion, pea gravel or river rock or um, tiles that, you know, allow grass or pebbles to grow or things to grow in between them are much preferred to, you know, now that we're just paving everything over with macadam, um, things like the big floods in Annapolis, um, most, most of those things are because, oh well, because of climate change and the extreme weather we're having, and also there's nowhere for the water to go, everything has been paved over. So, we want to plant wisely. We're going to talk a lot about planting natives um, and eliminating invasives um, in this talk. Um, we want to convert lawns into conservation landscapes, no maintenance, ground covers, grasses, perennial shrubs, or trees. And we want to use trees to save energy and remove all the invasives. So a lot of things that the, um, that the nursery trade um, brings into this country are the things that you just can't kill. They want to have 100% success so that they make money. And you know they want anyone to put it in, be able to put it in any way and not have it die. So those are the strongest plants, unfortunately, and those are the most invasive plants. Um, they don't choose plants because they're going to enhance our environment. They're in a money-making business. So we're now left with all these plants that have been brought here and used widely that um, not only don't help our biodiversity and our environment, but they actually really hurt it because they're crowding out the native plants and the wildlife and the insects have evolved over thousands of years genetically with the plants. So when you wonder what can a bird eat, how does the bird know what to eat? That's why they know. So if, with these plants, um, many of them are toxic, but even if they're not, they're not gonna recognize them as nutritious and they'll pass them by. and um, because they're not genetically coded. So native plants are plants that naturally occur in our region and which they've evolved. They're adapted to local soil, rainfall and temperature conditions. So because of that, they don't take as much work, right? Because they're adapted to this area. They're not some special tropical plant or whatever that needs a lot of fuss and care. 
They've evolved with the insects. And because these, of these traits, they will grow with minimal use of water, fertilizer, and pesticides. So when I say I'm only gonna plant something that feeds somebody, it's because before we brought in these plants from Europe and started growing grass, every plant did do something. It was a perfect circular ecosystem, which we have interrupted. So everyone's like, oh, what a neat idea. Every plant has a purpose. Well, that's why they're here. So we need to now understand that every plant should have a purpose and we no longer have the luxury of saying, I want, I need a plant this because I want it, because I like it because um, that is not working and it's gotten us into serious trouble. So how do we encourage wildlife besides planting uh, native plants that they know um, are safe to eat? Um, so net, the native flowers, vines, shrubs, and trees, right? And all of those things um, work in concert with each other and they create this wonderful, perfect whole. Um, people don't really think about a water source, but it's really important. And um, I live right near Stony Run and I have, you know, several bird baths and they prefer to come to my bird bath than to Stony Run, which is really saying something, which is a sad observation. Um, and in the winter time, when everything is iced over, I mean, no one thinks of that, but there's a lot of animals that overwinter and they need water. So I went to a gardener supply and got a very simple a uh, plug-in heated bird um, bath. And it's on my, uh, off my kitchen on my back porch. And it is the busiest. I know I'm the only one in the neighborhood who has one because I'm constantly filling it and it is constantly in use. Um, other shelters are really good. Brush yeah, piles, people don't think about that. Yes. Sorry, uh, Tia asked if uh, you had any issues with bird droppings. Absolutely, you know, that, that comes with the territory. I um, have no grass, I have all gardens, so um, I just sweep it away, you know, I, I sweep my porch and I sweep it away and I say, aren't I lucky to have all this nitrogen to, um, to amend my soil? <laughs> yeah, half, half empty, half full of the glass, you know, depends how you look at it, I guess. So anyway, a heated bird bath is really super important. Um, also brush piles, um, no one has a brush pile. Everyone is throwing things away. I say, never get rid of any of your organic material. I have this very Zen philosophy of everything you need, you have right in your garden. Someone who wanted to make a lot of money told you you had to throw away all your brush piles and leaves and then go to the store and buy mulch and plastic bags, right? Well, guess what all those branches and leaves you're throwing away are? They're mulch. So we can just make our own little system in our own yard without making a carbon footprint at all and without using any plastic and we save a lot of money. And I would rather be out um, shredding leaves than in line uh, or in traffic on the Beltway or in line at Home Depot. So it's a much, much more enjoyable and much easier way to garden. Um, so brush piles are great. You, it gives a lot of shelter for wildlife. You know, everyone is cleaning up and everything is too clean. And um, I say, permission to be messy. Leave your leaves and throw all the, I have, I don't have a big garden in the corner. I had to throw all my brush. Um, you know, it's kind of well-managed and whatever. And, but um, I leave it there in part of my garden. Um, pollinators, you know, especially if you're growing vegetables, but people that want to put in a pollinator garden and that's great, but they don't understand that there's a whole system there. We're going to get into my favorite thing in the world, a white oak tree in a little while, but if you have a white oak tree that's um, hosting over 550 beneficial insects, then you're going to have a more successful pollinator garden and a more successful vegetable garden. And you're not going to need um, chemical, um, chemical uh, fertilizers because you have the right system. And massing plants is really important because if you're a little bug or a little bee and you're flying way overhead, it's really hard to identify things. So if you have a garden where it's like one, 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 they're really not gonna be able to read what's in that garden. A good read is there's a mass of things. And it's also better garden design, having masses of things and places for the eye to rest um, so massing plants is, 
is super important. Um, and so Anna asked, um, our neighborhood has rats. Can rats live in brush piles? They can live in brush piles, but so can, they're gonna live, you know, it's a tough question. I don't know, Anna, what to say because they can live in brush piles, but so can the wildlife. And the rats are gonna live, I don't think they're gonna attract rats. We'll talk about composting later and compost pot. I've never had a rat, I live in the city. Um, oh, you asked the hard question. I guess you have to weigh the costs and benefits for you and you, you could try it and you could observe and, and, and see what happens. But the rats live everywhere, you know? So I feel like, I don't know, maybe uh, do something for the wildlife and you know the rats may take advantage of it too, but you, the wildlife at least has somewhere. So I don't, I don't know, I don't know how to answer that. Um, rats are a big problem. Okay. Oh, and then also look at this, look at the owl in the hollow of the, I love like hollow logs and all that stuff because it creates all these wonderful bugs that, and the, the hollow logs are decomposing and that's really good for the soil and the ecosystem and it amends things and brings in bugs and animals can hide in it. So um, maybe, I don't know, maybe more, maybe like an old log or something. You could try something like that if you don't want to do a whole brush pile. Okay, so here they are. Here's the log on the trail near me um, with the holes in it. And um, I know that I'm always looking in there. There's lots of things happening. The bottom is my brush pile. And I, you can't see the whole brush pile because I zoomed in because it was like picture perfect. I want to take a picture of my brush pile for this presentation and what was there by the gardener. So I was so excited. It was right there in, in the brush pile, feeling safe and, um, I'm having a good time and I'm he's most welcome in my garden because he eats a lot of mice and um and help and helps you know keep things in balance that's part of integrated pest management um so we're talking we're talking about every plant should have a purpose or every plant that is necessary does have a purpose and host plants are wonderful. This is one of my favorite plants. I have it. It's Cleone glabra, which is white turtle head. And it supports the, butter, the Baltimore checker spot, which I've never had when I live in the city. I am eternally optimistic. But there's lots of larva host plants. One of my favorite, it's either a large shrub or a small tree. It's called service berry. And it feeds the birds and it can feed you to the most delicious berry that's a taste. It's like a cross between a cherry and almond and a peach. And um, it also um, supports the lepidopterous bugs. Those are the ones that have, they lay eggs that become caterpillars and then eventually moths or butterflies that are beautiful and we need more of, but also the birds need to eat the caterpillars. So, um, that service berry, it's one of my favorite trees. It does a lot, a lot of good stuff. And this is spice bush. It's for the spice bush swallowtail. There's tons of this on the trail where I live, which uh, makes me very happy, a trail in the city. And I, you can't figure out what sex these are before you plant them. And they have to be in the ground many years. So I just thought, oh, I have two males. I'm never gonna get a berry. And it was five years and lo and behold, I had four red berries on one of my plants this year. So I know I have at least one girl. And um, it's a wonderful plant. You can, there's lots of medicinal purposes um, it fills. It can, and it makes a great tea. And if you squish the, crush the leaf, it has a wonderful smell, which is why it's called spice bush. And that is the spice bush swallowtail. How awesome is that? And the caterpillar. And that is what the, they call it a, I don't know, what is it called? The cocoon, I guess. That's what it looks like. 
So later we're gonna talk about leaving the leaves and remember all this because these are the things that fall down in the fall with the leaves. So when you take up your leaves, these are the things you're removing from the ecosystem. So let's keep all this in mind as we move along. And the milkweed for the monarch and the monarch butterflies are so wonderful. Um, if you plant milkweed for the monarch, it's fantastic. There's a few different kinds and the monarch caterpillars love ferny things. So I have a ton of dill in my garden and it's just, I have it in between everything. It looks beautiful amongst flowers. It gets a very pretty sort of yellow flower and it's called weed because it, it bolts, it goes to seed very quickly, but then it seeds itself. And so I throw down a handful at the beginning of the summer and it just keeps reseeding itself all summer. And I get, and there might be a picture in here, I get like five, six, seven of these caterpillars on it all at once. Um, so anything ferny is good, also um, parsley, but a fennel is another great thing to grow um, because it has a huge fern, ferny plume and you'll get lots of um, the caterpillars. So here's parsley for the Eastern black swallowtail, which is amazing. And I have all these in my garden and, and no one else near me has them. And it's because I have a native garden. And I give this talk, it's called Redefining a Beautiful Garden. So we have been indoctrinated that a beautiful garden is something that's very managed and controlled and has a lot of grass and has something blooming every moment. There's gotta be a lot of wow moments. I um, mean, a lot of evergreens and whatever. But to me, this is a beautiful garden. Sitting in my garden, being st still, smelling really good smells, the herbs and the spice bushes, and noticing all the life and all the things that are attracted to the garden. So, you know, I think we can redefine what a beautiful garden looks like. And um, we can appreciate other things. So anything that's trumpet shaped and in particular red will attract um, the hummingbird and it's really exciting. Um, there's also, uh, well, the, the native honeysuckle is fantastic, but I also planted um, jewelweed last year and you find that in, you know, kind of in, in moist spots in the shade on a trail. And I knew that native Americans would break the stem and use it um, the liquid in the stem for itchy things like poison ivy. So I planted some right near my gate because I'm always doing work on the trail and I'm always getting poison ivy and I figure I'll walk in my gate, I'll put it on, you know, this is a bonus. Well, it has a orange yellow trumpet shaped flower. I did not realize how many hummingbirds would be attracted to it also. So there's just so many surprises and wonderful things happening, you know, once you start sort of like build it and they will come. So sumac, any natives are important for birds. Sumac is, I was taught by Susie Cream, who's the head of um, Audubon at Patterson Park, that there's four different seasons and there's eight or nine different families of birds. Winged sumac, these all nine families of birds in every season. It's like the bullseye for feeding birds. And it's really dying off. We were in Maine this summer and it was everywhere. And I, my heart was just soaring. And we used to have one clump of it on our trail here and it's gone now. But it's um, a beautiful plant and a very important plant. Um, as far as, as trees go, the two most important trees for wildlife value are the white oak and the black cherry. And if anyone wants a black cherry, I have one. And thanks to the birds who are eating those little cherries all the time and standing other tree limbs and pooping out the seeds. So they've spread them everywhere. So I get lots of little baby um, cherry, black cherry trees all the time. So if anyone wants one, I'll take you one. And we'll talk more about the white oak later. Um, we talked about shelter. And if you can't have a... Um, if you can't have a brush pile, um, second best is having evergreens. Um, evergreens provide a lot of shelter for wildlife. And the Northern Bayberry, or the America Pennsylvanica is the uh, Latin name, is an evergreen. There are not that many ever native evergreens. 
It is an evergreen. It's not barberry, that horrible invasive plant with the prickers. It's bayberry, what they make the candles out of. So if you um, touch the leaves, they have a beautiful scent to them. And you can see those blockus blue berries on it. They are the fattiest berry that is produced out of all our plants. And when a bird is migrating, they need that energy. You don't want to just give them a raspberry that's kind of like us. You know, you're going to peak out like sugar high and then and then plummet. You want to give them, and it's a very overlooked plant. It's evergreen. It's beautiful. It smells great. It's very important. Yet no one is planting it. So I'm all for the northern bayberry. Okay, and then also if you have a really small garden, if you live in the city and you just have a tiny, tiny space, there are native plants that you can use that have a lot of wildlife impact and, and impact environmentally, and they're not big. Um, the, gray, the gray dogwood is lovely and the red dogwood. Um, there's many kinds of viburnums, but the arrowwood viburnum and the viburnum dentatum have particularly high wildlife value and they can grow in dry shade. And there's not much they can and they, they really do a great job. So they also really help erosion. Um, the bayberry is there again because I love it and I want you guys to remember it and use it. Okay, so you wanna encourage pollinators and by far the two hardest working pollinator plants in my garden are the mountain mint and, and uh, hyssop, which is also called Agastache. And they bloom from May, they're still blooming now, through October, and are covered with pollinators all through. Joe Pieweed is a great one also, you need wet sun for that. Um, that there's the hyssop, the Agastache there. Um, even, you know, herbs are really good. Lavender is not native, but it's a great pollinator plant and it has a lot of other purposes. So um, if you wanna mix in something that isn't native, um, look and make sure that it doesn't have, it's not invasive and that it, it does something, um, it may not do everything, but does something to add to the environment and to your lifestyle. More things. So you want to make sure that you plant um, pollinator plants that bloom at different times, like the solidago or goldenrod here on the left. It's blooming now and the bees are going crazy and it's a late bloomer. So it's really important because there's not a lot of things blooming now. So you want to try and find things that start early and things that go late um, so that you can give the um, pollinators as much support as possible. Okay, New England Aster is a great fall bloomer, really pretty, very easy to grow, and always has a lot of pollinators on it. Um, this is Asclepias tuberosa. It's a, it's a butterfly weed, and um, it's lovely. It's, and it uh, supports the monarch butterfly and a lot of other things too. Okay, so we talked about herbs. And we talked about ferny herbs, which are good. There's, I see the fennel in here and the dill, but, and the parsley, but oh, carrots. Carrots are also ferny, but you know, any of these other ones are great also just um, because they will attract so many pollinators and wildlife. Um, Anise hyssop is the agastache, is, is the hyssop. So um, you can think about, you know, if you have a, if you have a um, herb garden to plant them in big clumps, plant them in masses so that the animals can find them. Okay, so my preference is no grass whatsoever. I have no grass, I do not miss my grass. There's pathways, people say I need the grass so the kids can play. Well, I played in the woods growing up and they have these schools, I don't know if you guys have heard about the forest schools, they have them in, um, Germany now, and they found that children's brains develop better if they're out just in the natural world and using their imagination and interacting with 
um, all the na at, with natural things and, and doing lots of observation and, uh, and play. So they have schools in Germany now called forest schools and you, do, you can't get into one. And the kids, the preschool is all outdoors. It doesn't matter the weather. They're outdoors every day, all day. There is no plastic. The kids have whatever there is in the forest to play with and each other. And these kids learn team building and turn taking and sharing and you know everything they need to learn because um, they're, they're, in, they're in a good environment and they are testing much higher than the kids not in these forest schools. So that's really interesting. I'd like to see when they grow up how they're better rounded people I bet they will be. So please consider reducing your lawn area. Um, children observing nature and playing in nature is a wonderful thing. Um, all, all of us as Americans, we want grass. And I just saw this wonderful quote. Um, it's something like, and I'm kind of butchering the quote, but the Western settlers came here with the mindset, we have rights. The native, um, the indigenous people have the mindset, we have obligations. So, you know, you, you, someone who has rights is going to have a whole lawn with fertilizers on it and some with, with obligations. It's going to on, honor um, what we need to do to help our environment. Oh, and you can see here when I talked about the height of the plant is dictates the root depth. And here's a perfect example of it. So as you can see, the root depth mirrors whatever length the plant is. Here's a scalped lawn. It's one that has been cut too closely. So it has all these bare patches. Water is just gonna sheet right off of it. Even if it weren't scalped, water sheets right off of it. And it is doing absolutely nothing to help anyone in any way. Here is a lawn that has been allowed to grow to like three or four inches. So it does a little something and you're not using a gas mower quite as often. And this person started to put in some nice little mulchy thing here I've seen with some grasses. And what I tell people is you don't have to get rid of your grass all at once, you do it in steps. So this person, I would say, increase both of these beds just by a foot every year. So first what I would do is probably connect those two beds. And then I would swoop this one in front and include the pole here. I'm assuming it's a light pole around it. And um, you can just keep going from there. But um, turn, we no longer dig out grass and dig in the soil and turn it over because it has its own microbiome. What we do is we, I call it the lazy gardener, but I think it's really being an efficient gardener. You just get thick cardboard that doesn't have any packing tape on it. You put it down and you put mulch on top of it. Anything that does not have air, that does not have oxygen, cannot live. So it will die. If you do that in the fall, it will die over the winter. Um, and you really don't need to do anything. And then in the spring, you have a beautifully mulched bed and the cardboard is decomposed. If it isn't, the cardboard hasn't decomposed, you can just make an X of it, flip back the corners, plant your thing, flip the corners back down and move on. So here is a garden with no grass. I just, it gives me such relief. It just feels so much better. I just go, ah. Oh. And look at all the work that garden's doing. There's grasses and there's things producing berries and, um, and every plant there has a purpose. And guess what? No maintenance. Okay, so another great thing about natives is they have really, really super duper long roots, deep roots. So if you look on the left and you see how the non-natives, um, very little. And fescue turf, do you see that little guy? Like almost Zippo. But on the right hand, the natives, I mean, they want to survive. They're here to do business. And they put, they put down roots. More roots, less erosion, more um, soil amendment, more... Um, yeah, okay, more soil amendment and um, more stable environment. So what can I do if I don't want grass? Um, Dutch white clover is Dutch, but 
It is not invasive and it is an amazing pollinator plant. So if you want something that you can still walk on, um, Meyer Seeds is downtown on Caroline Street is our last seed company in Baltimore. We used to have eight um, and they are wonderful and please support them. We need for them to stay in business and you can buy huge bucket of um, Dutch white clover there for a few dollars. And um, it's absolutely wonderful. It has a kind of matted thing it does that helps stop erosion and you can walk on it and it, it's a pollinator. Um, but then there's tons of other things. There's a native pachysandra that I love. It's in the middle there. Um, there's all kinds of grasses. Number four is Pennsylvania sedge. You, you see that all over. And you know, if you see something that says Japonica on the label or um, Chinesis, you know it's from Asia and that it's not native. If you see something that says Pennsylvania or Canadensis or Virginiana, you know it's from this, this uh, from, from the North America. And the closer you can get within North America to your area, the better, but you know if it's from North America, at least it won't be invasive. Okay, so to get the most out of your garden, you need to have every layer. As I said before, people think about just sort of horizontally what they see like right in front of their feet. They don't think about the roots going down and they don't think about the things going up. Doug Tallamy, who is a brilliant entomologist who I'm gonna talk about later said, if you don't have an oak tree in your garden, you are not reaching even half of its wildlife potential. So you can see here you have, and everyone wants to run right to the perennials. I get that, I want instant gratification too. They're fun, they're easy to put them in, but that is not how you put a garden together. Um, if, you don't know where you're, if you don't know where the shade's gonna be, if your trees aren't in first, you don't know which perennials to plant. If you don't have a, your hardscape done before you plant the trees, then the tree might be in the way where you wanna put a pathway. So to design a garden, you start with the hardscape, you figure out where your patio and any pathways, if you're gonna have a fence, then you plant your trees, your highest, biggest things. Then you plant the canopy trees. Then you plant the under canopy trees, the ones that grow in the shade, they're not as tall, they grow in the shade of the canopy trees. Then you plant your shrubs of all different levels. And then you get to have fun and put in perennials and grasses and different kinds of ground covers and ferns but really it'll save you a lot of time and money if you do it in the right order and, um, and think vertically. Isn't that pretty? Well, the other thing I wanted to say about that, you don't have to go back, but the other thing I wanted to say about that is when you're out in nature, the reason it feels so good is because it's natural. And in nature, you get all these different levels. That's what's natural. When you go to a garden and it's just all flat, maybe with one tree or one shrub sticking up, it doesn't feel as good because that's not what we're designed to be in. And so we're part of this whole thing too. And so you will find when you imitate what's going on in nature, it's gonna work better and it's gonna feel better. Sorry, Morgan. Okay, so we wanna water efficiently when we're putting our garden in and, um, the old sprinklers and spraying with a hose are really inefficient. This is a soaker hose. It's amazing. It's, if you don't know what this is, it's so easy. It's just a hose with tiny little pinholes in it. And you swish it around in your garden and loop it around and you connect it to a hose and you put your timer on your phone for an hour and you walk away. And it just drip, drip, drips. It's micro irrigation. And um, it is by far the most efficient and the easiest because the only thing you have to do is turn the faucet on and off. Okay, now we're up to leave the leaves. Doug Tallamy, who I just mentioned, um, said, and of course we should know this. What were we thinking? The bugs lay their eggs on the leaves. The leaves have to go through a whole cycle. I'm, I mean, the bugs have to go through a whole cycle on the leaves um, and in the spring, then they hatch. If you rake up your leaves and God forbid, put them in a plastic bag in the landfill, um, or even if you chop them up in the fall, 
you are ruining the entire next generation of bugs. Bugs are the beginning of the food chain. No bugs, no life. So it's so obvious, but I'd never thought of that. I, I had to learn this again. And so please, please leave the leaves. And everyone's all worried about their grass, but they shouldn't worry about their grass because they shouldn't have grass. But what I tell those people is leave it just lightly on the, on the grass and you can just gently pile up more of it in beds. Don't ever use one of those horrible blowers that's belching gasoline anyway and is very noisy and annoying because it blows so hard, it blows all the bug eggs off the leaves and kills them. Okay. It also is a nice place for um, animals to forage in the winter and hide, and it puts a nice warm blanket on your, on your garden. Okay, so now we're up to a managing yard pests. And so we call this integrated pest management. And pretty much what it is, is leaving, leaving well enough alone. I'm a very much a non-interventionist. Um, a landscape shouldn't be completely insect and disease free. We don't need to control this. We need to just observe and be a steward and not you know, keep interfering. Definitely hand pull weeds, don't use a chemical to kill them. Hand pick off the bad insects like aphids um, or you can have attractants. You can have um, something that attracts the bugs that eat the aphids. Um, you can learn what bugs are good. Um, and if you have to use something, there are some environmentally friendly pesticides that can be used, um, particularly horticultural oils and soaps. But remember, every time you use something, you're gonna be doing something else you don't mean to do. So again, lazy or, or efficient gardener, you tell me. Um, Debbie, sorry, Tia has a question question, um, should the leaves be left in the natural spot that they drop in or on the grass? Yeah, well, if they, Tia, that's a great question. If they can be left where they are, that's great. Sometimes it's a walkway and people are gonna slip or they're gonna step on them and squish all the bug eggs anyway. So those I gently rake and I kind of save those leaves and I gently rake them and onto my property to a place where, um, where they'll be safer. That's a great question. Okay. Oh, can you see the bottom of that slide? I can't, but it shows the proper way to mulch. Um, the bottom of the tree, it's called the flare, needs to be above the ground or it will die. Uh, many people make the mistake of, of pushing all this. <laughs> Thank you, Tia, I see your yes. <laughs> it drives me crazy. I call myself a gorilla gardener because people put these, these volcanoes of mulch around the bottom of trees. And what you're doing is you're bringing all this disease and moisture to the flare and that's gonna kill the tree. Um, you have to make your mulch like a, like a bagel or a donut and make it all around the tree, but not touching the tree. And that way water can flow in towards the tree and not out away from the tree, which makes much more sense. But you should always, um, if you have a tree in the verge, you know, in between the sidewalk and the road or in a more public place, um, you should, you should do it anyway, but I'll, I'll, I'll be, in a public place, you should always, always have a big three foot wide ring around your tree so that weed whackers and lawnmowers don't insult the bark. The bark is what keeps the tree alive. It's what brings the nutrients from the ground to the ground. And if you insult the bark and disease gets in and bugs get in, the, the tree is gonna die. So mulching is super important. It holds down the water and it protects the tree and no volcanoes, please. Or should the mulch be laid down evenly? Um, well, the mulch, you don't have to have it everywhere. Um, you, can, you can use your leaves as the mulch and you use it as where you need it. That's a good question too. Like you don't need as mulch um, if it's, if it's not a place that's eroding, you might need more mulch, or if it's a sunny spot, you need, might need more mulch to keep the weeds down. But you kind of just, once you're out there and you get to know your garden, as things evolve, you'll have a feel and you'll see exactly where you need to put it. But mulching yeah. everywhere is nice because it amends the soil. Oh, there's Tia. Yeah. Tia, you have good questions. Yeah, I got a question for, for, so for the mulch. So the entryway is causes like a, 
long, like flower bed kind of. So mm -hmm. it grows a lot of weeds throughout the whole bed. So I was thinking that <clears throat> putting a garden bed, I mean, garden fabric, then mulching it would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, well, the fabric should never, ever be used. I'm so happy you brought this up because- Not even garden fabric? That's what they recommend. That is what they recommend. And guess who's making a lot of money on that? The people selling garden fabric. It is yeah. Plastic. It is, it's plastic, first of all. Okay. Secondly, once you put the mulch on top of it, it's not going to degrade. It's going to stay right there. So the roots, most of the roots can't get through that. The other thing is, that once you mulch on top of it, you think, oh, that's underneath. I'm never going to get a weed again. That is untrue because all the weed seeds are going to fall onto the mulch and then they're going to start weeds on top of that landscape. Right, because I sometimes right? I see weeds. Yeah, sometimes I see weeds coming through the mulch, but they didn't have garden, garden fabric. So I thought that was the trick. So you're telling no, me that no. even if I mulch it, it's still going to, you're going to still have some weeds, some. Well, you have to, you know, weeding, we're just not going to get away from it. The best thing to do is plant things so densely that no weeds can get in, crowd out the weeds. But you're right to use something rather than turn over the soil. You're right to use thinking that you need something to suppress the weeds. But we use cardboard because cardboard biodegrades. So you get a big old, just make sure there's no packing tape on it because that's plastic and it doesn't biodegrade. Like, you know, get a big old piece of cardboard and you, you can't leave any air holes. So you get big pieces or you have to overlap it and then put the mulch on top of it and you will kill every weed underneath there because it can't grow because it doesn't have any oxygen. Oh. Thank you for bringing up. I'm going to have to add that to my talk, that, that darn um, fabric, because it's really awful. And then yeah, you're stuck, I was gonna get then some. You're yeah, stuck and you can't them. dig and you can't plant. And there's stuff on top of it, and it's just a big mess. And then it starts to ripple. So definitely yeah. cardboard. And guess what? Cardboard's free. It's cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yep. free. Yeah. OK. Yep. Thank you All for right, that so, tip. Yeah. And then what I'm saying right here was my whole Zen thing about um, everything we need, you need to have in your garden. Once you have a garden up and running, you just take the pine needles or the trees, uh, the, the, the leaves or whatever, and you put that, and you use that as the mulch. Um, I, I'm the crazy lady walking down the street when people have bags of um, leaves and I go and I, my husband, you know, my poor husband has a lot of work to do because I can't stand it. I'm like, we have to open these up and lay them down in the woods and, you know, take these leaves off of the bags and um, wait till spring. And then people can chop them and then put them. So then you can chop them and put them and use them as mulch. And I wasn't going to buy another thing, but... And all I've, all I've done is, is get rid of and purge, but I now bought myself a little electric mulcher, not for the leaves, it's for all the sticks. And um, it has been, I think it was $130 and I've probably made about, I would say easily 20 bags of mulch out of it already. So it's already paid for itself. And I don't use any plastic, I don't try, but it's no carbon footprint moving stuff around when I already have the stuff in my garden. So cost average, I think it's a good investment. What about, um, we, back to the mulching um, piece, should you add compost with the mulch together? Because I have seen people Absolutely. that sell it together. Okay. Gold star, gold star. Okay. I'm going to get to that, but you're, I, you're, you are a very intuitive gardener, and I like to see this. This is what I'm talking oh, about. Oh, no, this I'm learning. I'm the student. Stuff. I'm just learning. Mm -mm, right, but what I'm saying is you're just learning, but look at all the stuff that you're intuitively getting right. And that is because this is stuff we all sort of have in our DNA and we all know, and we just have to access it. Mm -hmm. So now when I tell you these things, you have a place to, to capture it. And now this, and now you know this because, because of that, because everyone has good intuition. So we're going to get to compost in just a little bit, but compost is essential. And 40% of our food in the United States, 40% is wasted. It's just a crime and it, can't, it's, it, it doesn't get air in a landfill, so it can't break down. So it releases methane gas, which is what's causing all our problems. The number one thing you can do to help the environment after not, you, after not flying, you know, traveling by air, the number one thing you can do is to compost. And 
you're getting the most amazing stuff for your garden, all the amendments that you need, and you're not buying anything. Once again, everything you have is right in your own little system. Thanks for asking that, Tia. See, there you go. So you can put, um, I do a whole class on composting. And so, so if you guys want that another time, we can do that. But the, the, the very two minute lesson is that you need 50% green and 50% brown. Green is alive, it's the nitrogen, brown is the dead, it's the carbon. And the more surface area, the more it's chopped up, the faster it's gonna go. You also need to have air, so you have to turn it over or tumble it. You have to have water, has to have a little bit of wet in there. And you have to have some soil mixed in with all of your um, clippings and prunings because the soil has the microbes to help things break down. So that's the perfect combo. When you mix it all together, you let it cook, and then you can spread it on your, on your gardens and you will have the prettiest garden of anybody in your neighborhood. Oh, but one more thing about that is I'm very funny about plastic. If that, most composters are in the sun. And it seems to me, the sun, not a scientist, but the sun is heating this plastic and heating it up and, this, uh, and what you're gonna put in your garden and some of it might be your vegetable garden and eat is in this hot plastic container. I have to believe there's some kind of bad exchange going on there. Plus, if, you're, if you have a plastic composter and it's not up like this, even if it is up like this, rats can eat through it. So I'm trying to um, design a affordable metal composter. And for right now, the best I've gotten is to get a galvanized trash can. It's galvanized with zinc and it's perfectly safe. I've asked a lot of scientists about that drill holes in the side and bungee cord the lid on and use that. And when you want to tumble it, make sure the lid's bungee cord on tight, turn it on its side and roll it back and forth with your foot. And then you've, um, and then you've mixed it up. So try something like that before you invest in a fancy expensive plastic uh, tumbler. I'm going to need your compost class. Okay. Okay. I'll make, we'll get, we'll get, okay. I'll have uh, Tia give you, uh, I'll capture your name and I'll make sure we do that. I'd love for you to be in one of those classes. Everybody. Okay. So this is something I just learned and it's just brilliant and it makes sense. And this is why you never give away any of your organic material. If you're starting a raised bed and you're going to grow vegetables. It takes a ton. I mean, you know, say your bed is just four by eight. That's a lot of soil. I like, I, I make my raised beds, beds at least 18 inches high because that's the deepest root of any vegetable plant, tomato that you're gonna grow. And the soil in Baltimore um, is just so full of rat poison and lead paint and emissions. And I just want it to all be clean because it's the food we're eating. This is a German process called culture, and it's brilliant. The bottom layers, a lot of thick limbs and twigs. Then you put in leaves and other debris, lots of nice organic stuff. Then you put in your compost, and then you put in topsoil. How brilliant is this? As the, as the biggest things are lowest, as everything decomposes, it just amends the soil. So as the soil naturally um, goes down and you know, plants use up a lot of the resources, um, it is just getting re-amended with what's below it that is decomposing. Brilliant, perfect system. I like how much it. Does, I like how much idea. does it cost? How much does it cost? Nothing. Right. I like that idea. I like that. Because that you, yeah, because you just have common sense, but I didn't think of it. Right, you have several different, um, seven different, um, several different um, items that will help fertilize the soil. So that's yeah, that's cool. Versus just the exactly. dirt. I mean, you know, the soil exactly. and compost. Yeah. Right, and then you put your soaker hose. You kind of ask your soaker hose through the top, and you're in business. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's like a. A raised bed with a compost system in it. I mean, compost like yeah. T -shirt. Yep. Okay. Okay.
This is something else. And this is a concept I absolutely love. It's called permaculture. And it is working with nature rather than fighting against it. You're planting a tomato on the hill. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to water it. And the water is just going to run off and it's not going to get any of the water. Well, if you dig a little gully just on t- um, you know, on, up on the hill, just you know, north of it, and you let that part be a depression, when the water runs down the hill, it's going to get caught in that depression. And it's going to go in and it's going to water the roots of your plant. So there's a million different uh, things you can do with permaculture. But, you know, rather than trying to level things out or fight the water or reroute the water, you know, water's going to go where it wants to go. Say, okay, you're water. I'm going to let you be water and I'll use you to my benefit. So it's kind of fun for me because it's ever changing. It's a process. And there's just always some, some, something to solve, some, some like crap, some code to crap. So I have to put this in because it's part of Baywise, but um, I'm really not into fertilizing at all. I don't do it, I just use my compost. But if you're going to fertilize, um, you do a soil test and you see what, your, see what your soil needs. And then you have to buy the right stuff, follow the directions. And I really can't speak to this because I don't do this. It's not in what my practice is, but slow release. Low release nitrogen is good because if you use too much nitrogen too quickly, you burn the plants and they die. It's like too good. And so they recommend 10, 10, 10. So it's nitrogen, potash, and phosphate, and even amounts of all of them. But honestly, if you compost, you're, just, you're not going to need it. What are we doing time wise? Oh, we're already over. Okay, so we're gonna go past this. You have to know your pH. Just know that calcium and magnesium are really, really important to put in the soil. Okay, when to fertilize. This is, you know, this is grasses again. We're gonna go by this really quickly, unless you guys, do you need this? About the grasses were over and um, I don't believe in fertilizing grass. Um, But, Anything else, it says recently planted trees once a year. I would say if you've amended your soil properly and you continue to amend your soil, then you can just make your own, you can make your own a schedule. But I just um, am constantly rotating around and putting my compost on everything and rotating around and you know, just keep it in the rotation. And you'll know, you're no, you'll know if your tree is unhappy. Okay, so I don't know. Um, There's some laws that have to do with fertilizer. Don't put it on impervious surfaces, kind of obvious. And it can't be a super high nitrogen um, application. So compost. Um, And if you are, if you do have a lawn and you're gonna cut the lawn, don't bag it, just have it mulch right back into the land. And leave it high. If you leave it high, it'll at least slow down water a tiny bit and it'll shade out some of the weed seeds. Um, Native, some other good native plants and ground covers, just to get you all jazzed up. On the left, if you can believe it, that passion flower, which looks so exotic, is a native plant. It's actually a bit of a thug, but it's a great plant for the sun and it actually gets a big, almost like a kiwi, a big hairy fruit that I've never eaten, but um, lots of high, high, high wildlife value. If you want to have like a little bit of privacy, a screen from your neighbor on a fence, it's a great thing to use. And we do have, this is like a little ground cover and a nice thing to put in between stepping stones if the woodlands have a crop. So it's actually a native sedum. I think it's the only one. And I have just listed here um, more native shrubs. Um, these are some of my favorite, one of my very, very favorite besides the America Pennsylvanica is um, the Clethra elnifolia, the sweet pepper bush. Super high wildlife value, a very pretty 
shrub. It um, it colonizes by Stalin. So if you plant one, it's going to, in a tappy, it's going to keep getting bigger. And so if you want to make like a little hedge out of it, you can make, plant them like five feet apart and they'll all eventually grow together. It can grow in sun or shade. I have one in my rain garden, so it's getting lots of water and it's east, so partial shade and it is super happy. It's a beautiful inflorescence that smells divine and it attracts a lot of swallowtail butterflies. And then, you know, a whole bunch of other things here. Um, yeah. Bottle brush buckeye is a fabulous plant. It's very rangy. It's about eight by eight feet. Native trees. Okay, let's talk about oaks. Um, as I said, the bay was established around an oak forest. It no longer is. We've cut down all the oaks and we've also managed forest fires. And before there were forest fires that just occurred naturally. And um, it would, the fires would kill all the softer wooded trees. The oak has the hardest wood, the oak would remain. And then we had an oak forest. The leaves of oak trees have the reason they're so leathery, you know, and kind of thick is because they have something in them called tannins. And those leaves actually filter the water for the day. Most people now want to plant a maple tree, which is a soft wooded tree with a very soft leaf. And the maple tree does the exact opposite. Their leaves actually stagnate the day. So that is one of the reasons a um, oak tree is really important. I'm mostly just going to talk about the oak tree now, but anyone can text me or email me at any time and let me know what conditions you have in growing and I can help you get the right tree. Um, oak trees host over 550 different beneficial insects, insects and animals. They filter the water for the day. They are an investment in the future. They respirate uh, moisture. They provide enough oxygen for two people to live on a year. They provide shade, they provide, you know, cover for a huge amount of animals. Um, they leave their leaves on the tree. They don't drop until spring, so we don't have to worry about raking them up and ruining the bugs. They actually hang on to their leaves until the spring. They are our state tree. The Y oak was a white oak, and they are essential. If, if you are only gonna do one thing, plant a white oak, and please tell that to everyone you know. Okay, um, after that, there's a lot of other, that is the, oh, the other thing I wanna say is it takes the same, same, same amount of time, energy, and money to plant a small tree, an under canopy tree that's only gonna live for 20 years as it is to plant an oak tree that's gonna live for 400 years. So if I, if I want the biggest bang for my buck, and I do, if I'm gonna spend time, money, and energy, I want an oak tree. And we're also part of the green band, which is where the, what the birds follow to migrate in. And we have to keep up our green band. They go through our city. And we have got to keep up our green band and help the birds migrate, or we're gonna, we've already lost many, many species of songbirds. And we're gonna try and not lose any more. Okay, so you guys know what to do. Plant a white oak tree. There, it's a great street tree, by the way, because it has a tap root. Maples have a, roots that are very close to the surface and they push up the sidewalks. An oak tree is not gonna do that. And here it all is. Oh, it will also increase your property value by creating a buffer to noise pollution. Um, also, if you have a home, um, what, they, what people did before air conditioning is they had passive solar by planting deciduous trees, those are trees that lose their leaves, on the southern side of their house. That way their house was shaded in the summer and it was, and it was in the sun in the winter. Um, now people don't do that, they just keep turning up the air conditioning and the heat. But it really helps with energy costs. You save a lot of money, it feels a lot better. And then on the northwest corner, if you can, plant a, um, a conifer, a pine tree, or an evergreen, that also helps to block the winds. And my first house didn't have air conditioning, and someone knew what they were doing. It was an old house, and that's exactly the way the trees were planted. It was very comfortable. Okay, really quickly. 
because I think you already know from everything I've said, invasive plants are not native. They're from a different continent. They don't provide food for insects or wildlife. They don't support our ecosystem and they escape into the wild and they outcompete and replace native plants. All of our wildlife is starving because our native plants have been overcome by um, non-natives invasive. The worst offenders in Maryland are the multiflora rose. If you've ever got well, hiked and gotten a rose stuck on you that you absolutely can't get off, it's because it has a recurving uh, thorn. And that is a multiflora rose. And they're from China and they use them to stabilize um, sandy banks because the roots go down and then they hang a right or they hang a left and it's like an anchor. Um, so they've done that here and the birds, the rose hips look and taste just like our rose hips on our rose bushes. So the birds eat them up and then spread them all over the place. And um, they're, they're rampant now. Um, there's a bunch of stuff, um, you can look it up, but I can also, if you'd like to email me, I'll send you my PDF I've done on the top 10 things around here. Um, including porcelain berry, and I can tell you how to um, identify it and how to eradicate it. I have pictures of them in every stage, when they're babies, when they're adult, you know, far away, close up, and then different little pro tips on how to, to get rid of those things. But um, it, it's now time for um, us to make planting these things um, illegal because they're um, in many other states like Maine, there's a whole list of things like Norway maples you can't plant, plant anymore. And I think Maryland is close. We're, we're, we're one of the better states. Invasive trees, it's the Norway maple and it's the tree of heaven. And I'm sure everyone's seen the tree of heaven. And um, there's other trees that, that, that leaf there is called a pinnate leaf, the one with the stem with all the little leaves coming off of it. And pioneer plants have pinnate leaves and they're very important because they're the first ones to come up like after a forest fire. And they're the ones to come up and say to the other trees, it's okay, you can grow now. Then the other trees grow up and they kind of overtake it and they die back. The problem with the Atlantis is it doesn't die back, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, there are beneficial plants that have the same pinnate leaf that look like this. And the way you can tell if it's a tree of heaven and Atlantis is pick one of the leaves and crush it. If it smells like cat pee, it's an Atlantis. It's the bad one. You want to get it out as fast as you can because it has a tap root. And just within a year, it becomes really difficult to remove. Oh, and with the Norway maple, the way you tell it from another maple is, you don't have to go back, Morgan, um, is you break off a leaf. And at the end of the leaf, there's sort of like a little horseshoe shaped um, end of the leaf, if you look at that in some like, looks like spit coming out, then you know it's a Norway maple. If you do that to a maple that isn't a Norway maple, you won't get any of that um, like spit kind of sap at the end of the leaf. Okay, so here's a, there's a whole bunch of things. I'm not gonna spend time on it now, but just be really careful um, when you buy something, you know, ask questions and make sure you're buying something native and there's a uh, book put out by the Maryland Fish and Wildlife Service. I think I have a slide at the end so you can get, the, and it's a free PDF that you can download or you can order a book for $5. It is my Bible. If you have this book, you will not need me. It shows you exactly what goes where, what, you know, how big it gets. And it doesn't show you like the nursery, how big it is after five years. Well, how helpful is that? It shows you how big it is when it's fully grown and, you know, what, what things it does and, um, I think at the end we'll have that. If not, I will email it to Morgan and she can email it to you guys. The name of the book is, um, I think it's a quick wildlife guide. Hold on, I'm gonna grab it. Okay, here we go. It's called Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat, Habitat and Conservation Landscaping, Chesapeake Bay Watershed. And you go to www.fws.gov slash Chesapeake Bay, you can get one. And it is 
so easy. It has a picture, and then this little thing you follow across, mostly the signal, and um, it has yeah. never steered me wrong. Ah. Uh. You know, we don't have a lot of time, but I think you guys have seen the stilt grass on the left there. It looks like bamboo. And then this Japanese silver grass, we'll keep going. Grasses are super invasive. So make sure that you're buying the right ones. Um, again, I'm not even gonna take time. Let's keep going. Um, these are the invasive vines. Oh, here on the right on the bottom is the porcelain berry. You know, when you're driving around the highway and you see it's like a whole curtain of of green, that is all porcelain berry. It outcompetes our trees. Our trees are stressed anyway. It grows up them, it, it shades them from all the sun because it wants the sun and then it kills the trees. And there's a million little blueberries on it. They fall everywhere. And also the roots are really intense. That plant is, I mean, it's, it's saying, I want to be here. So they're not easy to eradicate. Okay. So still, I'm not even gonna go over this now. I can give you a list, but there's the porcelain berry at the bottom. That's what the berry looks like. Okay, purple loosestrife and this lesser celandine you see everywhere. I kind of want to just move through this really quickly because I'm, I'm so over time. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, but this on the left is super important. It's garlic mustard. And it looks very pretty and I've been fooled by it. It is, if you uh, squish a leaf, it smells like mustard and it actually is edible, but the wildlife doesn't recognize it as edible. And for every plant you see, there'll be 100 plants next year. That's how invasive it is. And it's very easy to pull out. And um, I only throw away the seed part. Japanese knotweed, let's just keep on going. Um, if you want to do trail work, please get in touch with me. I'll give you my whole list. Okay, so would you like to have your garden certified as Daywise? If you would, um, you can download the yardstick and just complete a little self-evaluation and then you'll contact the university. You can contact Morgan. She can hook you up with me or you can just contact the extension office and tell them you live in the city and you want to be certified. And let me tell you guys, this is no judgment. The guardians that need the most help are the ones that we want to certify because they're the ones that need the most help. If your garden is perfect, you don't really need me there certifying your garden. What's nice is to have the learning curve um, leveled a little bit and made a little bit easier for you and to have a plan. If you have a plan, you can do things and you can break it down and you can do it one step at a time and you know which step to take first. It's much more enjoyable and you'll have much better results and you won't waste any money. So don't be afraid. My whole committee is lovely. Anyone who comes is really dedicated and will help you um, in every way to solve whatever problems you have and to reverse what's going on in your And then you get a sign and you can proudly display your sign where everyone can see it. And then people can ask you, what is that? And you can tell them. <laughs> and you can tell them and you can say, I'm a badass. Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to sign Tia? <laughs> yeah. And a shirt. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. Maybe you need to be a master gardener. I don't know, I'm thinking. I'm thinking I am one. the end here. Yeah, I'm one. I, I graduate this this fall. I'm one. Are you a master gardener? Yep. Um, I I did one. Um, um, I visited the Pig Town Garden when you did those the, the that garden last before COVID. You did it before COVID. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 You know. Um. Oh my goodness. So I have. So you are you are you now a master gardener? Have you have you done your hours and everything? Yes, I completed my hours, but it's not official until the graduation. So it's this year. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not Tia McDonald, are you? Mm -hmm. That's yes. what I didn't. That's not the name you had on there. Of course, I remember yes. now. 
Yeah, the name on here might say Miss Sunny because that's yeah. my my garden name, Miss Sunny uh, for my community. Well, I know you as Tia McDonald. Hi, it's nice to see you. <laughs> nice. Thank you for tuning in. We would love for you to have your garden certified and also think about being on the committee. There's a little bit of continuing ad and we're going to try and hold that in Baltimore this uh, spring, and it's going to be evenings and weekends, so people who work can do it. Okay, so, I'll definitely be um, connecting with you. Okay, that would be wonderful. I'm in the directory. Okay, well, you, you're not Richard, so what's your name? Oh, I'm Debbie. Sorry, Debbie okay. Swartz. I'm on my husband's okay. computer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay, yeah. yes, I'll, def I'll definitely be reaching out to you, Miss Debbie. Wonderful, wonderful. I'll look forward to it, Tia. Okay, is that the last slide? There it is. There it is. Thank you guys so much. Um, my email, um, I don't know, Morgan, can you put my email up? Yes. yes okay. I will. The hotline is always open. I love to do this stuff. I love to, um, and every year I, um, I divide plants in my garden and I give them away every fall. So anyone starting a garden, I, um, my greatest joy is sharing my garden and helping start other gardens. So please ask me any questions and I will do my best to answer them and to support you in any way I can. And if it's three years from now, that's fine. I get all these random things, it's fine. Random is good. Well, thank you so much, Debbie, for that. Um, I know well, we're running a little bit- Thank you for asking me. Open. I was honored that you asked me to speak, Morgan. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, it's been so great to connect with you through this and through the Master Gardeners. So I'm really grateful. Um, and I don't know if you do any kind of, uh, I'm going to log off, but I don't know if later on you do any follow up with any kind of um, like feedback thing, but I would love feedback on how I can make my program better. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can definitely, we can definitely do that. I can, um, if you have like a feedback form or something, I can send that out to everybody after oh, I don't I don't um, but I could make one or I could look one up on Google does anyone yeah. have a feedback form um I can that's like that's a good question that's something I should maybe maybe I should put that together as like a Google form so I can put that together yeah. and, um, parks and people I, I speak for parks and people and they have one so you maybe you can ask them what theirs looks like oh true okay that's cool yeah okay. yeah I'm connected with them that sounds cool so does anybody okay. have any other questions I know we're running like way over time if you want to send questions later oh and I see one in the chat um, oh that's such a good that's such a good question um is that Matthew who asked me I think uh, okay Anna. well anyway anyway planters um planters you know obviously everything is happier in the ground um but I've seen small trees and shrubs live in planters for a really, really long time. So um, Matthew, if you don't mind emailing me that question, because I really can't say off the top of my head, um, which are the, I only know the perennials that do best in planters, but I'd like to give you some greens. So if you don't mind emailing me, I will research that for you and I'll get right back to you. Um, yes, yes, Andrea, that is exactly what you should do. So if you have a nice round ring, three, like three foot round ring of mulch under your tree, just keep widening that. And so you're going to have some shade plants first, right? You're going to have some shade plants. And then as you start widening it, if it's whatever it's closest to, if it's a sidewalk, your house, whatever, attach it to that. And you can keep going like that. But starting with something already there, an anchor. This is what I'm talking about, how everybody really knows what to do. It's just reminding us what to do. That's, that's perfect. Anyone else? Andrea, you got this. <laughs> okay, well, any more so please questions? Please share my email. Questions. Yes. Yes. There's no, there's no bad questions. Um, I'm always happy when someone wants to know something and I can help them. Yay. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, cool. Well, thank you thank everyone you. for being here. Thank you, Debbie, so much for guys. this amazing thank presentation. Thank you so much for having me on your forum. I really appreciate it. 
Oh my gosh, you're the best. Uh, All-star first lecture of the series. Yay. Um, Yay, well, I know all the other lecturers. You're in for a, you're in for a treat with all, all the other three. Getting, oh, it's a good, nice lineup you have. It is. I feel like we got like, yeah, the best of the, the master yeah. gardeners. Um, yeah, and if anybody's interested in coming to like the other workshops, I'm going to send out um, in my follow-up email the Eventbrite to sign up, um, though you probably already did hope and um next week or not next week two weeks from now um we'll have butterfly betty as she's been called in the master gardener program do a talk about starting native perennial seeds so if you want to grow some of these plants that you've heard all about today it's a great opportunity to know how to do that you know on the the cheap side and also you know it's kind of cool to grow something from seeds so yeah what's nice is with having me first was quite brilliant because i gave you the overview like the big picture of how it all works and now you'll get into more specifics so well done thank you morgan of course okay, okay. well last chance if anyone has anything else to say any questions all good thank okay. you okay i'd love to hear from you guys thanks for coming Thank you all for coming. Have a good night, everybody.